All right. So this is my first time trying to do this with an iPad, and I don't see. The chat. Maybe because nobody said anything yet. All right. So welcome to 199 chat. Uh, trumpet Q and A number 199. We do have some two previous questions. I will take them in order that they came in. The first one is from a comment. Um. I hope I get to see you guys' Oh, that's, there it is. I can see it. Hello, Karen. Nice to see you. Yes, I went, because this is on my iPad. This is my first time doing it on the iPad. And they recommended that I do vertical. Um, that's not... That wasn't my first choice, but um, anyway, so that's that's what they wanted. All right, so I had a comment. Someone was asking. the The screen name is Scott Dobry. He was asking about the physical trumpet pyramid. How much time should be spent? in each one of those levels. Um, so like, for example, how much of the, the lip buzz should you do? How much mouthpiece should you do? How much uh, long tones should you do? And one of the things, you know, Whenever I teach the physical trumpet pyramid, I always tell people, you don't have to buy my books, right? You don't have to buy my books. But one of the things that the books do for you is it gets that balance right. So I'm not going to say, hey, you should get my book. I'm not going to say that. Um, but the balance is automatic when you get the books. Uh, in fact, I was just telling a student this week that the balance of how long you should spend on each one of those is something I put a lot of time, effort, and energy into. And I don't mean a lot of emotional time, emotional effort. I mean, I turned it into a almost like a scientific... Uh, thing that I was researching what was best what 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 amount of time should be spent so let's talk about if you have an hour because it should be in fractions if you have an hour to practice how much time should be on the lip buzz if you have an hour to practice I'm saying between five and seven minutes. Now, five minutes might be too much. I think, you know, it does depend on how far you are into your playing. But the best way to put this is, according to how, uh, how long your routine is, right? If you've got an hour-long routine, then 10 minutes, I think, is too much. If it takes you 10 minutes to get through the lip buzz, let's say you're using my book, and it takes you 10 minutes to get through the lip buzz, something's wrong with that picture. It should not take that long. There are students that I've worked with that have to take too long and everything. And I, that's something I'm trying to figure out. They, they'll show me what they're doing and it, it makes sense. But I don't understand why it's taking so long. So, five to seven minutes at the most, I prefer more like three minutes on the lip buzz if it's an hour long routine. 
but sometimes I can't do it in three minutes. It depends on what exercises we're doing. So the mouthpiece buzz should be just a tiny bit more than the, the free buzz, the lip buzz. Long tones are going to take a little bit longer. Long tones might take 10, 15 minutes. So you're already looking at almost a half hour. Um, now the long tones should take longer if you're doing them right because we want to do the, the longer notes, right? We want to make those notes longer. Uh, and you're not going to get full benefit if you don't uh, spend that time. So the next thing is... Let me check, make sure I'm not missing some. Okay. Hello, Seppo. Nice to see you. The next thing is with the, the what do you call it? The, the scales, right? The tonalization studies. The tonalization studies, I like to do whatever, how long ever it takes. Usually about 15 minutes. That's 15 minutes for 20 exercises, um, roughly a, a, a minute per exercise, but that's if I'm doing the higher routines. Sometimes I can get that down to 10 minutes. After that, the, the lip slurs. Now, for me, the lip slurs, I want the lip slurs to be short and out of the way. I know a lot of people practice a lot of lip slurs, that's not part of my method. It can be part of your method. It's not part of my method. So I want the lip slurs to take less than five minutes. And then we're moving on. After the lip slurs, we're talking about... Okay, so the articulation exercises where there's slur tongue and then the intervals and all that stuff. The articulation exercises should have no limit. If there's anything you're gonna take out of proportion from the rest of it, the articulation should be the one thing that you do that with. Okay. And then same thing goes to the uh, multiple tongue. If I keep standing here like I don't know what I'm thinking about, it's because I'm not used to this. I'm looking at the screen that I normally look at. And by the way, the reason we're doing this is because my, that, that webcam is going out. So I'm in the process of shopping around for a webcam. Um, this isn't so bad. All right, so I did have another question. Let me make sure nothing come in. Okay. This one was from Sean. Sean says, are there different kinds of swing? And the short answer is yes, there are different kinds of swing. Uh, so much so that when you use a, a, a music writing software like Finale, you actually have settings for hard swing, light swing, heavy swing. We actually have that. And in the old days, in the old days with Finale, you used to have to program it in digitally. Like tell them what ratio you want the swing to be. Now, let's talk a little bit first of all before I, I move on from that, let's talk about the way I teach swing because I tend to teach swing to the beginners as a articulation. But that's not really what it is. Swing is a rhythm. It's just that when you do certain articulations, it forces the rhythm to change. So, if I play a, a line, if I play a line, 
that swings, but I don't articulate anything. I'm still swinging that, even though I'm not tonguing any of the notes. It's the rhythm that makes it swing, not the articulation. Okay? So that's very important to keep in mind. A, a lot of the stuff I do that's educational is to give you the right end result. You don't need to know. Because you know what? I've seen so many educators try to teach swing. First of all, you know that song that says, uh, no, not song. What am I saying? There's, there's like, uh, like news clippings or, you know, from the old days when, when someone would ask someone like Louis Armstrong, what is swing? And Louis Armstrong would say, well, if you have to ask, then you don't know what it is. Right? That's because swing is one of those things that falls in the cracks for the words that we have to talk about. Swing is one of those untouchable things. You can't describe it. You, we can't touch it. We can't um, measure it. We can't examine it. It's, it's, uh, it's a feel. It's, it's something intangible is the real word for it, right? Um, so, when you see these educators that try to teach swing by telling the students that it's a triplet, da, 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 and, and in some cases, like in a ballad, it might be a triplet. But that's not how you teach swing because you can do triplets and still not swing. So that's not swing. So the way I teach is to first of all get my students to listen to swing. It's not that we, I'm not, I, I never said to the students that swing is articulation. No. Do your listening. Saturate your ears with that sound. And then do these articulations and you will swing. Most people, some people we have to straighten it out and maybe hint towards a rhythm. But you know, you can, there are some people that swing that the, the notes are almost straight. So the rhythm thing doesn't work. It has to be a feel. That's why we do the articulation, but the, what always comes before the articulation is the listening. The, the articulation is just as bad as the rhythm approach if there's no listening. You have to do the listening. But once you've got the listening and you start articulating a certain way, then the swing starts to happen and it happens naturally. You don't have to try to count beats and stuff like that to try to make the swing happen. Okay, so that's the two opening questions. All right, so Karen says, would you talk about airflow and the effects of too much or too little? The air, let me see, I just lost it. The air, is airflow supposed to vary with dynamic changes and such? So, okay, so that's a little bit of a complicated issue. When we talk about airflow, we're usually talking about air support. How much we're pushing from the abdomen. And yes, so let me, let me think about this real quick. Um, if we're talking about the flow through the horn itself, then yes, there is a change in the, the, the volume of air when it gets louder, it gets more volume. When it gets softer, it's less volume. Is that happening here? Yes, that's true too. 
it's not the truth of it though is not that simple okay um because what happens to get that greater flow through the louder notes is that the the aperture the the oral cavity has to open up there has to make the body has to make room for more air to come out you don't just push from here if all you did was push from here and everything was the same the note would go higher so you have to compensate by opening up so that the note you know when you really think about it mathematically playing trumpet when you add range and volume mathematically speaking the trumpet playing the trumpet is a, a, a extremely complicated uh mathematical feat extremely complicated because the same opening that we need to play loud is the same opening of the aperture, opening of the oral cavity to play low. So how do you play low and soft? By the way, that's a, a wonderful exercise. Playing low, soft notes. So I don't believe that our, our conscious mind needs to know all this stuff. This is stuff that that really, it's nice to talk about. It's nice to have theories about this and have theories about that. It's nice to use that information to come up with new exercises that help you play better in those situations, like playing loud and high, soft and low. Those are two contradictions. We say we need to open up to play low, but we have to close off to play soft. And then the same contradicting in, in, in the upper register, we have to have a smaller aperture, smaller oral cavity to play high, but a, a larger oral cavity, larger aperture to play soft, uh, uh, loudly. So how do we manage all of that? We manage all of that just by doing it and doing it often enough that it becomes automatic to us. I hope that makes sense. Okay. That's a very important point. Hello, Jeffrey. Nice to see you. So, yes, we want, we want to have more of that flow under certain circumstances but it's not always good enough to just from the abdomen blow from there okay there's a whole system of changes that has to happen and the best way to manage that is to just do it make it a a habitual thing something second nature that you don't even have to think about okay let me see what else we've got here seppo says let's see here well okay we're back i'm having trouble accessing the chat Okay, here we are. Seppo says, I've been told that the word swing includes the message of swing as a musical style. There are also other swinging rhythm styles like shuffle and so, so on. That's correct. That is correct. So a shuffle is a swing style. I see it in terms of of category, right? So swing is the overall category, and then you have subcategories beneath that category. And a shuffle is a sort of swing. So that's how I see it. Now, 
Sean says, what is the purpose of the lift slur option and in one breath? Do you think? Okay, okay, so that's a separate question. Um, so I, when I put that option in there, what he's talking about is the lip slurs in the chops books. Because I originally had it separated. So let's say we're doing the um, the first one in the chops player book. <laughs> That's the wrong one for... Okay, then we take a break and then we finish it, right? If I was going to follow the plan I had when I first started writing the book, that would have been the end of the exercise. And But when I was doing it myself, I thought, that doesn't feel like it's enough. So I thought to myself, I, I thought, some of the students are going to have a rough time taking it to the to the new ending the new ending goes like this that's the new ending some students are going to struggle with that some students will have too much trouble getting that ending to work for them. So that first ending is now just an optional ending. The To take it all the way through, there's something that happens when you're at the end of your airstream and you play a, a, a slur like that, up like that, hold the note and then slur back down. Um, I think you get greater access to your strength. It's, it's not necessarily, necessarily stronger. I don't think you ex actually become stronger, but you're using more of your strength because you're at the end of your air, right? When you're at the end of your air, your muscles are sort of in a different spot. It's sort of like, the, the example I like to give, it's sort of like uh, doing arm wrestling from this position. You're in a bad, compromised position. But if you have the strength to recover from here, that's, it's not necessarily more strength. Right? You see what I mean? I guess some people would say mathematically it is more strength. Um, but it's the same muscle. It's just in a compromised sit position. So, so yes, you're using more of the muscle. Um, and you're being more thorough in the way you use that muscle. Okay. Then he says, Sean says, do you think swing in jazz is becoming obsolete in the new generations? No, I do not. I think the 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 swing is there. Do they do more stuff that doesn't swing? I, I think there's a lot of that because of the influence of rock. But I don't think it's obsolete. No, I don't. I don't. I would not agree with that. Okay, what else? Um, okay, no questions. Hello, Heta, and he hello, JJ. Nice to see you guys. Thank you for joining us. Any other questions? First time on the iPad, it is a little irritating. I wonder if there's a way I can set it so that the chat stays on. It keeps hiding the chat. I don't need to see myself. <laughs> In fact, if I could just turn me off <laughs> and just look at the chat, that would be better. Um...
Yeah, I'll have to look more into that to see what I can do. Not that I plan on doing this forever. When I get a new webcam, we'll go back to the webcam. Any other questions? Nice to see all you guys. I was beginning to wonder if anybody would ever show up on a Saturday. <laughs> but I get it. I know, I know it's, it's hard to find a good time. This is just really the only time that works for me right now. Um, because of changes I'm making. Any other questions? All right. So we had two gigs this week. I played, I told you guys about it last one time that I had a Klezmer gig on Seppo says, as I really do not know how the American beginning trumpeters do learn the basic theory needed in music, reading and so on, how and how much do you teach music theory to your students and how? Well, let me say again, <laughs> Whatever it is that the Americans do, I don't know. <laughs> because I stopped doing a lot of what is normal for, you know, I don't think that a lot of the new people care about theory. I could be wrong. I think the, see, so let me, let me tell you about this. We, and it's and it's really backwards and stupid, okay? And uh, the, it is rare for you to hear me criticize band directors. And, 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 and technically right now, I'm not criticizing a band director. I'm, kick, uh, I'm criticizing the system, which is not the same thing. So I don't mind doing this, right? Everything here, at least in Texas, is so music competition based that the way they go about it is to do things that will win them competitions and quite frankly I think most of the music theory stuff is left behind because it really doesn't in their mind in their mind it doesn't really do anything that will help them win, win contest And here's where I see it the most. As a trumpet teacher who teaches the kids that are in their bands, you'll notice that they don't do advanced key signatures. And when I say advanced, you're lucky to have three, four, five of anything, sharps, flats, nothing. They try to keep it in the middle of the road, which is... And then the same thing is true with time signatures. Yeah, so this is uh, un unfortunate. Let me see. Unfortunate constantly ha just said 100% UIL is the worst thing to happen to music. And this is what I'm talking about. Okay. So, so yes, um, they try to make everything simpler so they can win contests when in reality, I bet five bucks without, without wasting, without adding any extra time, I bet five bucks if they would go back to the old way of doing things, the old way of teaching where they did teach theory, where they did learn hard key signatures, hard time signatures, when they did learn how to count difficult rhythms, I bet those would be the bands that would win. But, you know, 
it's like a, a almost like a drug, really. They've got to have their 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 first division scores or whatever. So anyway, now how do I teach theory? I like to tell students, and I just said to a student this morning, I like the theory to be done on the horn. I like for them to learn the theory on the instrument as we're moving through that stuff, right? So, so we don't bombard them with theory at the beginning in my lessons. The, the, they only need to know the theory enough to get started. And the reason I do it that way is so that I can keep their interest. Okay? So the very first thing they're going to learn theory-wise is what lines or what notes. Now, I do want them to know what the notes are. So we put, so I'll have them uh, write the, the letter name and the fingering over the notes. They only get to do that once per note. But then we learn the theory as we go. It's not, it's, I don't do formal uh, theory courses or anything like that. I don't do anything like that. Um, I spend a lot of time talking about the theory when it's appropriate to do that. So, um, but they're going to do it on their horn. Uh, you know, the, I said that uh, that I did this earlier today, right, in the, in the lesson, um, because we were talking about the spellings of the minor 7 chord. The, the, the one that we did today in the lesson was a G minor 7, and we did the expansion on the G minor 7, so that, so, and uh, well, the way this works is you have the chord symbol on the sheet. And while the student is looking at the chord symbol, they're playing an expansion study on those notes. They're looking at the chord symbol, the G minor 7 symbol, but they're playing what I just played now 10 times. When they played that 10 times, they go on to the next note. They do that 10 times, then they add the next note. Okay. And they keep going until they reach the top of their range on that chord. So like the second octave, we go back to those notes. We're not doing extensions. I do not teach extensions this way. That's how they're going to practice it until they reach the top of their range. So that's just one example. That's music theory, but they're learning the music theory on their instrument. Well, uh, same thing happens with intervals. So like when we're doing the tonalization studies and they get to the third exercise, <laughs> We're going to talk about what thirds are. That's going to be on their horn, but they're they're actually playing thirds on their horn. Same thing if we're doing the intervals. We talk about what intervals are, how they work, and we'll if I have to, I'll I'll pull up finale in the middle of the lesson and show them where the naming of the intervals comes from and stuff like that. Okay, so yes, almost all of the music theory is on the instrument. There's very little. Um, here's another example. Learning the relationship between the major and the relative minor. They, they don't learn it here first, they learn it here first. I have exercises for them to do. And when it's when it's appropriate, when it's time for that to be discussed, I have them do these exercises that go up the major scale down to the minor so that they see the relationship between those two.
And then later, if it's appropriate, I, I have exercises also for what, what we call tonic minor. I don't know if that's the same in other languages. Um, tonic minor is like C major, C minor. Tonic minor would be the, having the same root as the previous instead of relative minor. Okay. So yeah, that's how how I teach the theory. It's all on the instrument. So JJ says, any warm up recommendations for brass players? Yes. So and it's the same as the question later after that. What are the best warm up for trombone and baritone? It's the same. Um, I teach. The first of all, I believe in practicing a daily routine, and that daily routine has a build up, a, a warm up built into it. And basically, what you do, if you go on YouTube and look for my video called the um, Physical Trumpet Pyramid, type in, type into YouTube Eddie Lewis Physical Trumpet Pyramid. And the video will come up that describes the order of the exercises you should do. It starts with lip buzz, goes to mouthpiece placement, mouthpiece buzz, long tones. Um, and then now today, I, you know, I have a student that, that flew to see me in... Uh, like over 10 years ago, 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago. And so now he's taking uh, Skype lessons with me. And he's on the old system. The old system, after the long tones, I put the lip slurs. But in the new system, and I say new because it's been like, like almost 20 years on the new system. I put the scales, the tonalization studies, after the long tones. So let me do this again. Lip buzz, mouthpiece placement, mouthpiece buzz, long tones, scales, lip slurs, articulation studies, and then multiple tongue. So that's, that's what I teach for a routine. And then that's also what we do if it's just a short warm-up. Okay, that's my take on the warm up. And you can, like I said, you can learn more about that on the, uh, that video. All right. Unfortunately says that makes sense. That would help more with the oral part too. Yes. So, um, talking about the music theory stuff, if you learn it on your horn, now, the, the biggest reason why I teach it that way is because that's how I learned it. And, you know, I took all these music theory classes. I started in high school and, and then into college. And for the most part, except for the very advanced stuff, for the most part, that stuff was all extremely easy because what I was practicing on my horn included all of that. So I just took that to another level. The way I teach it, I just took it to another level. It's all on the horn. That way you're getting the greatest benefit. Now, is there some stuff that we might do more intellectually? Yes, there is. I can't think of it right now what it is. Um, you know, I think we do that more often with the students who are also studying composition. So then we will, and also for that matter, now that I'm thinking about it, yes, there is a more of an intellectual component for the advanced jazz improvisation. And that can be practiced on the horn, but it's a lot more difficult to make that happen. Any other questions? 
I do have to quit right at 2.30 today because I'm going to a, I'm entering a chili cook-off. Woohoo! For our church. So, yeah. I got to start working on that. Get everything cooked up. Any questions? I was telling you guys I had a klezmer gig last week and then uh, a gig with my band. <laughs> Karen says, yum, a long way to fly though. I think this is going to be a good, a good recipe this time. I did a bunch of homework and um, I'm going to add, I'm not going to tell you all the ingredients, but one of the main ingredients I'm going to put in there, and maybe some of you would say, ooh, yuck, but I'm going to put mole in it, in my chili. So I'm excited about that. I'm going to be very careful about it. I don't want it to be too... Unfortunately, he says, I hope you have fun with that. See, I just lost his message. Um, I appreciate these live streams and your YouTube channel. It is really a great resource for de developing players. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Any other questions? Hello. Uh, Dennis, nice to see you again. Yeah. I hope you're doing well, Dennis. I've kind of lost touch with you. It's not intentional, just a lot of stuff going on. Any questions? Yeah, I'm not a big fan of this iPad thing. Dennis says, busy times, still doing the routine. That's great. Good. Seppo wants to know, what is my favorite trumpet piece? You know, most people, I got to tell you the backstory for this. And I can't pronounce it. I'll pull it up. Um, let me, I'll open up the folder that has it. Um, and this might change, who knows? I love this piece. And, you know, most people, when they say, oh, this is my favorite, a lot of times they take into account how hard it is. And this is really not that hard. But I just love it. And I, I would like to be the first trumpet player on YouTube to make a genuine recording of it. It's concertino number three. And I can say his first name, Fernand, Andreo. That's the part I have trouble with. A-N-D-R-I-E-U. It's a, obviously French. Fernand Andreo. I'm obviously not pronouncing that correctly. But I love it. That's... It's, it's a simple, like, turn-of-the-century type piece. Um, nice little andante in the beginning.
yeah, not playing it so well today, but it's it's a a really really pretty piece. I love it. So I would have to say that's my favorite right now. But that said, um, only by a very very small margin. I have a lot of pieces I like. Um, let me see. I actually have quite a number of solos, and I, when my son, when my son was living with us, I told him, you're not staying here without, without paying rent, and since you don't have a job, you're going to work, <laughs> so I, I made him work, I think it was like two or three hours a day, um, and one of the things I had him do was digitize my whole solo uh, library. So I have a huge uh, library of solos, huge, huge library. And there's so much stuff in there that I enjoy. It's a shame too, because I don't get to play any of it. Um, that's, I, I told you guys that I don't have a C trumpet. That's why I don't have a C trumpet. You know, it's one thing to say, oh yes, I'm a classical player. Um, to never, ever, ever play this stuff in public. You know, uh, it really does start to, uh, if I, if I, yeah, from my perspective, it really does start to feel like that. Uh, the whole classical side of my career was just a waste of time. It's not, I don't really see it that way. Don't get me wrong. I'm talking about the emotional side. You know, we all have intellect and we have emotion. Um, me as a, a um, stoic Christian, uh, stoic being the adjective, Christian being the noun. Me as a stoic Christian, I don't really care much about emotions. Not mine, not other people's either. Um, so, but... But as far as the way it makes me feel, um, that's what it makes me feel like. There's also these pore. And once again, it's a, a, a simple, it's called, so Julian Pore, six esquises. So they're like little movements, what I would call a miniature, because each movement is just one page long. And to me, that's the definition of a miniature. Um, of course, it's not so miniature for the piano part. <laughs> but, but for me, yeah, the, the... And it's just a beautiful... It's a, this one's a little bit more modern. What else do I like? I, there's a lot of the Baroque stuff. That I like the fash. Um, yeah, there's just so much of this stuff that's just beautiful. There's been some great trumpet writing over the years. You know that? Some great trumpet writing. And, and that's why when people choose to play my stuff, I, I actually am very honored by it because they have so many choices. Um, what else? I like the Artunian. You know, for church stuff, I there's a lot of Bach stuff that I like to do on like the piccolo. Um, I have in the past done the Air on the G string with with the organ on piccolo. Did I miss any of these? Oh, look at this. I've got a bunch. So Ledinsker asks, do I still like running circle of fourths licks? No, I don't. 
I don't do circle of fourths much anymore for anything. Oh, sorry. I forgot to lock it. So no, I don't do circle of fourths. You know, when I learn a new motif, I will go through chromatically, not circle of fourths. I'll go chromatically up in half steps, drop it down the octave and finish back. Okay. Matias says, Como estas? I'm doing good, thank you. Matias says, what is my favorite song? Oh man, that's like the same kind of issue. Favorite song, I don't have a favorite song. I, I'm, I'm, I would have to say, you know what my favorite song, and people don't like to hear this from me. My favorite song is the song I'm listening to at that moment. <laughs> okay. That's how I want to be always. Okay. Cellular Nation says, hello, Eddie Lewis. It's great to be on your, to join your Q&A today. Well, that's, uh, it's great to have you here. Thank you. My uh, James says, hello, James. My range is up to double E flat, but I can only lip buzz to A. Is it common to hit a ceiling with lip buzzing? Should I keep trying to get higher or just not worry about it? I think you should do both of those. <laughs> Don't worry about it, but keep trying to get higher. Yes, it is common to, to max out. Um, so yes, don't worry about it. That is normal. Led asks, uh, what is my favorite valve oil? I use something that's hard to get. Let me go grab it real quick. Binac Pro. And I, I remember when I was I, at ITG this last time. And the guy told me, oh, that's terrible oil. I, you know what? Um, it's the best oil I've ever used. So, and I, officially we sell it, uh, but we only sell it physically to the students because we don't sell physical products through the mail. And that's an old uh, can of worms to open up there. Our postal service is a disgrace and it becomes more and more of a disgrace every year. Um, it's a very sad thing. But that's why we don't sell it online or anything because we can't get it to you. You know, they can sell us, they can send us stuff from China for two or three dollars. And for us to send that same thing to someone here in the States would cost us like 14 bucks or something. I'm not exaggerating. Um, there's something very, very wrong with our postal system. And so when people say, why is it you only sell digital products on your store? That's why. Um, that we, we just had no, you know, once, once we started selling the books, because I wanted people to be able to get physical books, but once you started getting them on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, places like that, uh, there was no point in us selling the stuff through our store and then charging five times the, 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 sometimes, like if it's Amazon, a lot of people don't pay any shipping at all. So, yeah, that's why we don't sell the oil officially outside of our students. But that's the oil I use. Now, to use that oil, you have to keep your horn clean because it does gum up. 
So, and maybe that's when people have a negative thing to say. Maybe that's why they have negative stuff to say, because it does gum up. But if you keep your horn clean, it's not that bad. I, you know, and, and this is not the selling point. Um, a bottle like this lasts me about five years. Lead asks, how often do I clean my horn? Also, where do you take your horns for repairs and deeper cleanings? So, I, I flush my horn once or twice a week. I actually take it to the sink. I pull the mouthpiece out. I'll, I'll put the, the, the spigot here and I'll flush it out and then blow all the water out. I do use uh, spitballs. That's, I think that's why my horn is always so clean because I do use spitballs. Um, and then maybe once a year I will do a full cleaning. Uh, if you're doing the spitballs, if you're doing the, the regular flushing, there's not much of a need. Uh, when I do, when I finally do the cleaning, there's no dirt coming out of my horn. So uh, when I clean it, it's more for the outside of the horn because right, like right now, the outside of the horn is pretty nasty. I was just thinking about this earlier today. I really need to get um, get it washed because it does look pretty bad. Um, and then as far as who I take it to, I, I, right now, I'd be lying if I didn't say that I take it to H&H here. There's a H and h like less than five miles from my house. And I do take it there. I don't take it there often. Um, I would take it to the guy on the other side of town if I wasn't so, you know, <laughs> what do I mean? Um, you know, it's just, I don't know. I'm, I'm not real happy with the guys in town that do this stuff. Cellular says, Eddie, have you ever played the Newport Jazz Fest or the New Orleans Jazz Fest? If so, see, I'm having trouble keeping these up. Um, if so, please share highlights and favorite jazz tunes you played there or anywhere. Thanks. Um, so I've not done anything with my band at that level. I've done the Galveston Jazz Festival. I've done the Kima Jazz Festival with my band. There's been some others like that. So, so like low level local festivals with my band. Um, I did do a jazz festival, jazz festival in Birmingham with Bubba Thomas and the Lightmen, but that was many years ago. Um, and here's the thing for the tunes that we play. I do on, when I do a festival, I only do with my band original songs. Um, and most of those originals, there's no recordings of them. So it would be hard to point you in that direction. Um, that band that I played with at the festival in Birmingham, we used to do, what is, we did uh, I forget the name of it, Michel, Cherie Amour, right? I don't remember how to pronounce that. You know, it's like, it's like not really a jazz song, but we do that as a jazz song. Bubba Thomas has passed away though. I shouldn't say we do that. And, and 
So it was cool that gig because we had um what's his name? The trombone player. Um Frank Lacey was on the gig. That was very nice. You know what that reminds me? I also did a jazz festival with Conrad Johnson Band in Austin. Uh, and Barry Lee Hall and Frank Lacey were both on that gig, if I remember right. So, but no, I don't do a whole bunch of that kind of stuff. Especially not that level. Oh, so, Led asks me, who is your favorite Houston-based musician? Oh, my. Who's my favorite Houston-based? I would have to say Dennis Dotson. We've had Dennis Dotson on here. Uh, oh, do you know what? Dennis Dotson, also um, David Caceres. I worked with David's band, and that's the only reason I didn't think of it right off the top, is because he's my boss. He was, he was my boss for 20 years. <laughs> and um, But yes, I, now I have to change my answer. Not Sorry, Dennis. <laughs> I would have to say David Caceres is my favorite. But, you know, that changes as people um, you know, because a while back ago, even when I was working with Dennis, I mean, with, uh, with David Caceres, um, I would have said that Larry Slazak was my favorite, but Larry Slazak passed away. So, yeah, a lot, there's, it's different if we're talking about people who are still alive, right? All right, guys, let me see if there's any more questions and then we'll shut that down. Let's see here. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> All right. So James says, never knew about spitballs, just looked them up. Do you have to blow them through for each valve? So I do, I do once with all valves down, once with them all up, back and forth between the two. All right, well guys, it's nice hanging out with you guys. I gotta get cooking, <laughs> literally. <laughs> okay, God bless you and we will see you on the next one of these. I don't even know how to turn this off. Let's see here. Help, help, how do I do this? Yes, okay, thank you. We'll see you next.